I'm Corey Beek. I'm assistant professor here at UT Austin, and I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker, Jenny Wu. Um, I first met Jenny about three and a half years ago in 2014. We held TextFab here at UT. Hopefully some of you were there. Anyone? Some? I don't know. <laughs> that is before your time. Um, but we invited her um, to speak about her work and uh, also participate in a symposium. Uh, back then, the work was amazing. Since then, her work and the work of her office, Euler Wu, which she runs with partner Dwayne Euler, has exploded literally in all directions. Um, the same year that she was here, in 2014, she launched Lace, a jewelry company that specializes in 3D printing stainless steel and precious metals. This last year, they completed a large-scale residential tower in Taipei, and then they were also selected to design a 12-mile stretch of the LA River as part of, as part of Frank Gehry's uh, master plan. So she's a designer working at all scales and is really a Jill of all trades. I won't go too deeply into the bio, which you can read online, but I will point out a few things. She um, teaches at SciArc in Columbia, and this next semester will be teaching at the GSD at Harvard, and has also taught at a number of other schools. Her office has won many awards, include, including the 2013 Architectural Record Design Vanguard, and also the Emerging Voices Award from the Architecture League of New York, and many, many others. Um, they have published books, which you should definitely purchase, and you should also check out her jewelry line and pick up something for your loved ones <laughs> or yourself. Christmas and holiday Thank you. Season is coming up. <laughs> I didn't uh, make him say that. <laughs> she paid me for that. Uh, so just a little bit about her work. Um, what really strikes me about their work is the direct translation of the digital to the physical with about a clear as translation as is, as is possible, um, transcending and in some ways erasing the divide between the two. When we build a digital model, we work with points, which become lines, which become surfaces, and finally volumes. Um, but it's the line that holds everything together. It's the genesis of surface, but also the end of surface. It's the limit of a thing and the transition between things. Lines define figures and forms, and we cannot model without lines, and we cannot build without edges. In his book, The Architecture of Variation, Lars Spoybrick says this of lines. Lines are connective agents that repeatedly find each other solely by crossing. Lines can slide along each other, they can bounce or even lock into each other, they can entangle, they can merge, uh, bundle, split, anything. The flexibility and variation lie not only in the curvature of the figure, but just as much in the connective strategy, in the line's richness of agency. He then goes on to describe three historic and sort of stylistic uses of lines. Lines of the picturesque, which are serpentine lines with two loose ends, um, that can define figures that are entirely free of constraint. Lines of the Art Nouveau, which are vegetal. They are rooted with one fixed end and one loose end. And then finally, lo Gothic lines. Lines that have immense freedom, but are also fixed at both ends. They are infrastructural lines connected to other things, and they are system forming. As you'll see in Jenny's work and the work of Euler Wu, their lines are all of the above. Um, as Mark Foster Gage notes, lines can also just be lines. So drawn not to something, but as something, not as part of a network or a map, but as a willful act of design. So in the work of Euler Wu, you see lines. They're not hidden away or buried. Some are thick, some are thin, some are continuous, some are dashed. Um, they are both willful and meaningful and hover in that purgatory between digital and real, holding somehow onto the virtual, even as they are made physical right there in front of you. So with that, I have, I'd like to please welcome Jenny Wu. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is, that, is it on? OK. Um, yeah, um, thank you for being here. Um, I'm really happy to be back in, in Austin. And yeah, it was, I guess it was three and a half years ago when I was here last. And I, I remember thinking, uh, walking around the school and thinking that um, a lot of the, the work uh, in the building really resonated with the kind of work we're doing uh, in the office. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be back. Um, so this lecture is going to be um, a little bit um, unusual. I'm not going to kind of present one project chronologically over time, but the first two-thirds of the project, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the things that uh, Corey had brought up, sort of our uh, research and obsession with line-based geometry, 
and how over the last 10 years it has um, evolved and incorporated ideas uh, in surface as well as volume. Um, and then so I'll actually show a, a cross section of work we've done in the last 10 years and then the last third of the, the lecture I'll talk more specifically about three projects that we recently finished and, and how all three of those ideas gets weaved into those projects. So um, who, who are we? Uh, that's often a, a question um, we get. Um, we are based in Los Angeles. Um, both my partner Dwayne Euler and I uh, teach at SciArc. We've been there for over 10 years. And you know, we both um, were not, you know, we were both educated on the East Coast. Uh, I was at Columbia and the GSD. I had Michelle <laughs> as an instructor. And then, um, and we moved to, from New York uh, to LA. Uh, mainly we were a bit frustrated with um, how work was being, um, the types of work we were working on in, in New York. And uh, when we got to LA, we, um, we started teaching at SciArc and really found this community of uh, amazing emerging practitioners. We're also faculty there. And, and it, was a, it was a really great place where you know, we would uh, compete against each other, but talk about you know, the, the, the types of work we were doing. And um, we really felt like, and, and also something about the atmosphere of LA being, there's a, a kind of legacy of experimentation that we were able to find even younger clients who were willing to spend money or spend even just a little more money in trying something different. So we found that it was a, a kind of hotbed for architectural experimentation. So uh, back to who are we? Uh, I always get this question like, oh, you're an architect, so what kind of architecture do you do? Um, and I like to think that, um, you know, you know we, we don't do specifically commercial, residential, but we like to design at every scale. So we have projects as big as a 16-story uh, building to uh, as small as a piece of jewelry on your body. So just to kind of um, show you that, that kind of range of projects, um, this is the largest project, which I will talk about um, a little later on, um, a 16-story um, residential high-rise we just completed uh, this summer uh, in Taipei uh, to um, a commercial uh, sales center. Uh, it's about five stories um, also in, in Taipei. And over the last 10 years, we've been known for uh, the type of uh, installation work. Um, we have been pretty productive. We probably have done now in the last 10 years, maybe 12 to 14 installations. Uh, we do on average at least one major one, sometimes more than one, which is crazy. Um, and this is a piece uh, we completed um, for um, an exhibition, but then was later purchased by SFMOMA. And even to the point of making physical models, uh, this model for that last project took longer than the project <laughs> to make because we realized at the scale of how we make this and tr trying to use the strings to test how we would loop and, and understand how to string these things. Uh, there was many summers of interns helping us with that. Um, and. Uh, even things that are you know, smaller objects, like um, this was for an app called Headspace. Um, if you guys ever meditate, it's a great app. Um, they uh, came to us with an idea of doing a, a meditation pod and that they would want to deploy it in public spaces. So the, the, the brief was like, how do you make something that's so intimate um, but not claustrophobic, but still open. So um, we created these, uh, these pods that they will launch um, hopefully next year. So there's an um, army of them. Um, <laughs> and we even do things like um, tree house. Um, and this is not the only one we've done. We're working on a new tree house also in upstate New York. This is actually in our own backyard for our kids. But, um, <laughs> 
um, which was, was kind of fun. Um, and lastly, we've done also a series of furniture, which a lot of times we use some of these smaller scale projects, um, like furniture pieces, um, to test some of the larger ideas, whether it's a, a way of assembling pieces, materials, and um, so. And the last one, which I, I will only talk briefly, I could do a whole lecture just on the jewelry alone, but um, is the, the lace collection, which uh, I started two years ago or three years ago now. Um, which we use the same ideas of understanding what the technology could do. Like, why would I use 3D printing instead of you know, manually making a piece of jewelry and using the benefits of that to create pieces that would work. Um, so for example, like making a necklace that interlocks makes sense in 3D printing because you can literally build in all the th interlocking within the necklace and then you kind of brush off the powder and you come out with this full piece printed rather than um, a kind of craftsman, an artisan that would have to make each link individually and assemble afterwards. So, um, so we've, uh, over time we've um, worked on pieces and recently we, uh, maybe I'll be showing that later, um, we've also uh, specialized in uh, printing in the precious metals. Um, we even started working on a lot of um, merging of like traditional diamond setting with, um, with uh, 3D printed pieces. Um, and this is um, a, a necklace we recently um, figured out. We worked with um, uh, a 3D printing company that fully uh, 3D print. This is a direct print. It's a steel uh, 3D printing that is also interlocking, which is very, very tricky. Um, and was just recently uh, acquired by LACMA, the LA County Museum of Art, um, in their per permanent collection. And some bracelets. They're like mini versions of our architecture. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of the range of things from uh, like designing at a, a large scale. Um, but how we work on it is, is, is an important topic. And um, you know, we always think about like when you look at our work and that you can understand the, the the genesis of the work, whether it's a big project or a small project. And uh, because we, we felt like it's important for us to work on a problem over a long span of time. But it's also really important as you're not someone who's only spent 10 years working on one problem and not know how to evolve over time. So, and a lot of it, um, you know, we really started on the, the problem of line to surface and to volume. And it, it, it has to do with also a kind of basic way a, 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 a young firm go from doing like installations, things that don't, re, don't have a lot of requirements to a real building that really requires waterproofing and, and you know, all the kind of details that make it happen. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of cut across that, that trajectory of our work um, over time. So, you know, the first five years of our office, we really worked on a lot of line-based projects. And these are sketches, hand sketches, not uh, digital, hand sketches uh, by my partner, Dwayne. Um, and the thing that, these are his doodles, by the way. <laughs> um, like, he'll take a trip from New York to LA and then do a sketch kind of thing. And, um, what is really incredible about these drawing is that if you think this is all ink drawing and there's no pencil underlay. So you can't actually draw a line all the way across without thinking ahead, how do you make a knob because that other line has to cut across it. So you have to be a very kind of three-dimensional spatial thinker in order to produce a drawing like this. And um, what is also important to know about um, our ideas of lines, um, there are obviously many different kinds, um, is the idea that line for us is always three-dimensional. There's always a foreground and a background. And every time, even a drawing like this, you can really zoom in and understand you know, more detail as you, and something else reveals itself as you get closer to it. But even at a, at a, a further scale, you might understand a kind of larger organization. 
Um, and even uh, in recent times, as we are thinking about um, ideas of, uh, of volume or figures that get trapped within the line, thinking about how lines might bundle into a figure and you cut it with these kind of black splotches. And these are things in, as, as we, uh, as the office start to uh, evolve and thinking about other things, how we start to incorporate our ideas and lines with, with uh, volumes and figures. So uh, between 2008 and 2011, uh, we built a series of um, installations made all of aluminum tubing. Um, I will just really quickly go through it. Um, and you know the funny thing is like you, you know we moved to LA 2004, and when you like move to a new city, you have no work. Uh, it's not like you hang a sign and someone says, "Oh, come hire me," you know. So what we realize is that um, the things that we weren't able to do, like in New York, like there's just too cold, there's no space, you can't build anything, and. We, we always had this kind of knack of building, and we thought, you know, why don't, instead of waiting around for clients to come, like, why don't we just invent projects that we, you know, can just make happen and build our portfolio? So uh, the first two projects, which I haven't showed, but, you know, first you do a, your own, like, office. The next one you do for your parents. And then, <laughs> and then the third one, you're like, okay, we ran out of everyone. So, <laughs> like, uh, so we, um, approached uh, a gallery and we said oh we can build this really cool thing and you know we'll build it out of aluminum we've never worked with aluminum before <laughs> never welded before and Dwayne had like asked a shop guy at Cyarc for a one hour training on welding and then we built this thing right and then what was crazy about this is also it's like a 23 foot can lever we didn't know this whole thing will stand up and we hired, we had Arab on this job, and then they told us this, they, they like kind of broke their software because it was, had such a tortured load path, um, because not, they would just wasn't clear how it was coming down. But you know, we learned so much from it, and, and I think that there's something about just not being afraid to do something and, and figuring out how to do it as you go along. And that spirit, I, I think, over time has really changed the way we also design. And so we started doing a series of these uh, installations. This is the second one, which was actually a, a, a competition um, for um, a, another gallery. And it was like kind of ceiling piece that then would fold down to become um, like hanging armature for artwork or exhibition. Um, and like something about you know, we kept, we always think like the people we really admire, like architects like Fry Otto, like people who really worked on something and able to innovate as they learning something else about um, uh, the kind of trade and, and different qualities, not just like a technical thing, but understanding how we would uh, polish off the, the aluminum to how we would, in this case, this project versus the last one, we actually bent the aluminum instead of welded every joint and realized that it gave the project a completely different look to it. So we kept thinking that, you know, we, we would keep doing work as long as we're learning from it. And as soon as we get too comfortable, we'll, we'll move on. So, um, so this second project, we le really learned about uh, bending and uh, this third one, um, and over time, all of these projects, if I had, wasn't clear, we actually designed and built all of the projects. Uh, this was a, a project we did for the Sire Gallery. And you know, we had this idea of creating a staircase. Um, and so instead of being just a simple object in the space, it was something that people could actually use for a period of three months. Um, and our idea was using a one inch aluminum tubing, which was incredibly soft. And, you know, engineer was like, I don't know, you know, and they wanted three inch aluminum tubing for every piece, which would have kind of killed the look. And one of the things that you realize is that also how you work with engineers and like, so then we went back, it's like, what if we bundle three one inch piece and weld it together and it would perform like 
you know, one three inch. And they're like, great idea, we like that. And so it was actually a way for us to then add more lines. And, um, <laughs> and then also, you know, in fact, whenever at the end, you know, our engineer were going there and using the shake test, which means they shook on it and see mm -hmm. where it was soft. And they were like, we really need another piece there. And we had a system of figuring out how to add it without compromising, you know, the, the look of the project. And also over time, we really had to figure out how to build these things so that, you know, uh, how do you translate something digital to the real and be precise about it? And, you know, in the beginning, we were building these crazy jigs that were more complex than the, the projects themselves. And over time, we also learned to do those much better and also not so crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but even like this, we, were, we had a system of figuring out how to do it, and then we like lock it in place and to check that the geometry was all correct. Otherwise, everything was so fine and flimsy that if something goes off the whole stairs, you know, the form would be crazy. Um, and the, the last of these um, aluminum-based project was this uh, project we did um, with an, an artist um, who had a relationship with the Muhammad Ali, um, the boxer. And uh, he had this idea about um, this uh, a kind of uh, idea about a face um, and wanted to create a face with uh, a series of, you know, those speed bags you do with, you know, when you, when you box. So basically at uh, a few, there's no, uh, but um, if you look at the drawing on the left, there's like a, where if you, there's only a one vantage point about 30 feet away, you can see uh, the face of uh, Muhammad Ali. But everywhere else, it just becomes this kind of field of lines, points. Um, and for me, this was a, a great. Um, it was one of those like it's very Instagrammable. People were like there and you know taking the picture. I see the face, and it really um, also helped us. Sometimes architects were so used to talking to other architects, and that at, there's various ways this project. Like some people don't care about the face, and they really care about how you put together this amazing thing, or some people really care about the face, but there's different ways to engage the public that I thought was really, it was a great learning experience for us. So yeah, so there's the face. And um, after we did about you know four or five of these, and then the installation gets bigger and bigger, and welding like, a million aluminum pieces became more and more like, and also we felt like in, in the last project, it was, you know, two and a half stories tall. It was really huge. And we wanted to uh, think about um, other way, other materials and how to work on this, this problem. As well as there's uh, new projects that require um, just ideas of surface. So, um, so when, when we thought, oh, wow, we've been really good with this whole line thing, and now we have to deal with surface, you know, what do you do with that? And, and what we didn't want it to do, which was sometimes the kind of obvious thing, is like you take a line, it becomes a frame for a piece of surface that you inset into it. And we always wanted to figure out how to create this kind of loose fit relationship between the line and the surface, and how you might, um, at moments, it becomes like, totally taut and other moments one system might take over and the other uh, other system emerge so uh you know what's been a pretty amazing part of being both in uh, at SciArc, uh, being part of academia as well as practice is that we're able to we do a lot of these kind of exploratory models and and things that allows us to uh, kind of explore these topics before it gets on to like a really big project um, so these are also um, thinking about kind of bundling of, of lines, but then these surfaces kind of weave up and down into, into the piece. And then uh, this was our proposal for um, about a few years ago, um, the Guggenheim Museum in New York had the 50, 50th anniversary and they asked uh, uh, several hundred um, 
designers to propose a kind of intervention uh, or rethinking of the atrium. And, uh, and so uh, kind of a funny story is that they had, because they had such a huge number, it was like 200 designers, uh, they said, okay, everything has to be 2D, 2D drawing, you know, it's gonna be a drawing, 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 and then they send another e email that says, it has to be a drawing, drawing, drawing. And then so we're like, what if it's like a two inch deep drawing? <laughs> so we uh, decided to do a kind of compressed relief model drawing that then uh, played around with this idea of a kind of uh, new staircase that weaves both surface and lines up um, the center of the atrium. And then we like, like I, we literally sent, like I had sent like my cousin who lived in New York and told her to push this in and then close the door and run away and then see what <laughs> happens. And then uh, I guess a year later, we had a pretty prominent wall because uh, it, was, it was the only thing of its kind there. So anyway. Um, and then about uh, five, six years ago, we also started to get um, um, more work um, in Asia as well as uh, really jumping up in, in scale and thinking about a lot of kind of renovation of um, existing buildings. And a lot of time these are like facade projects. And so this was, this was actually a, um, a, a prominent tech company in LA asked us to reclad a, uh, a old um, uh, 80s building in in Hollywood and uh, we designed uh, this new cladding which made of um, a metal mesh and this was one that we really kind of explored the idea that um, at the moment it becomes super taut like most of the project is actually really simple mesh cladding but they're at the moment where the the undulating the undulation occurs is where a new restaurant happens in below and this kind of um, mesh kicks up and reveals the, the workings of the structure underneath. And so this, this kind of play, and um, we, we really started to explore um, in some of the competition that we did. This is um, another competition which was for the Guggenheim Helsinki which we also, um, if you are, I mean, everybody entered that competition. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, there was an idea about the face that was uh, towards the harbor, which had this more ephemeral kind of almost leaping into the harbor fabric-like. And then um, on the other side, it kind of breaks down to smaller scale, kind of reaches out um, more infrastructural uh, way into the city and connects different parts of the city. So having that kind of dual reading of, of the project. So um, so after um, we did a bunch of those uh, aluminum based projects, um, and I had mentioned something about SciArc, and SciArc is, is, a, is a really interesting school in that um, it really values um, faculty that are practitioners. Um, and so every, uh, this is no longer happens, but uh, for several years, uh, a faculty would design the graduation pavilion at uh, SciArc. And, and our graduation is in September, it's out in a parking lot, it's just like, it's all different. And so we thought, oh great, yeah, we're gonna, and mostly the, there was the brief was, we have to house a thousand people and create shade uh, sometime early September, and that was the only requirement. So when we started, we're like, oh, well, let's do some lines, not thinking, like, how do you create shade and all that stuff. But we thought, okay, well, we can't, we, we, it's so big that we got to start working with a different material. So we, uh, we, we played around with the idea of knitting and uh, knitting sp specifically with rope. And what we realized is that there's, you know, if you look at a, a net, um, on the top uh, is if you take a conventional knot and net where each intersection is a, a knot, it's a, it's a tied knot. So as you try to deform it, it, it drapes like a catenary. But if you have the one below, which is a knitted net, so every intersection is actually loose, you can actually kind of adjust it inside um, 
to make it work to uh, different geometries. So, so we had an idea, okay, we're, we're gonna knit. And so in studio, we had like students, so we were watching YouTube videos, learning how to knit and <laughs> uh, people had these like knitting Nancy's and we were um, exploring and also just understanding the behavior of, of uh, a, a net. Um, so exploring all of these kind of different ways of creating a canopy, which we know we start to really enjoy and like. But we realized like we still haven't solved the fundamental problem of creating any sort of shading. Um, so we um, then started to think about how do you incorporate material into this construct and not without just kind of draping a big sheet over the whole thing. So, you know, we did some, and this was a, a really huge model. We really tested, I mean, we also simulated it digitally, but we also tested physically on site, figuring out how to um, actually place the net, not in an obvious way, but the, the fabric in an obvious way, but actually hang it between uh, two layers of, of uh, net. So some of the kind of construction shots of us, if you see that uh, these kind of wood things on the bottom, that's actually a 40-foot giant um, knitting Nancy. And um, that's how we actually knit it in the ground to create this canopy. So you can see more of that. And we actually had thought that we were going to place the fabric first vertically um, along the grain, but we actually decided to do a, against the grain because we realized by the shifting of the two uh, layers in net, the, there was this kind of illusion of these fabric almost like they're creating a, a torsion that we really, th it almost feels billowing even though it's just from the kind of geometry of the two nets. So yeah, some of the kind of final shots of, of, of the, the final pavilion. And this was at uh, the graduation and, and generally most people were shaded. <laughs> 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 it did a pretty good job of shading uh, our thousand people. And the person welding, that's my partner.
So I mean, uh, I just want to say a few words about the the videos, and I'll be showing a few more videos uh, in my lecture. And you know, it was one of those things that maybe like it's LA. There's a lot of film people, and it started as a, a thing where we worked with another artist on the Ali project, and he had her film crew to follow us around, and then. When we got the video, we realized it's such a great way to kind of capture the spirit of, of the process and to understand, you know, you, you really feel like, oh, man, that was a lot of work. <laughs> Every time I watch it, I'm like, oh, those were hard days, you know, three months, like, in the hot sun, like, pouring concrete, you know, welding steel and cutting, and, you know, those are, you know, that, but at the same time, it really kind of, it just makes you really feel passionate about architecture every time you see it. So. So we keep doing them. And over time, we'd also learn to film a lot of these things ourselves and actually do the videos ourselves. Uh, OK, so uh, last topic is, um, as I mentioned, we over time, we've uh, worked on uh, much more uh, bigger buildings. And sometimes it requires that we actually have ideas about enclosure and, and, um, and real volume although not this one. Uh, this was for the Beijing Biennale um, in uh, 2013. And uh, there was something that we learned from the Ali project where it was like there was something people can understand quickly. And then when they engage it, something else happens. And so we thought an idea of doing something that it seems like a, a simple cube. But as you approach the cube, it becomes dissolved into a, a series of lines. And in fact, what you don't know is that that cube is actually kind of, there's actually two large um, voids within the, the tube and that you would never understand until you get close to it. But we also realized that um, our approach of uh, whether you start with the lines first or do you actually start with the volume first um, to, uh, you know, this idea also like, you know, we are designing the positive of the, of the volume or of the embedded volume or, you know, how do we work on this problem? And so uh, in the recent times, um, maybe in the last three years, we started working on a series of these kind of smaller objects uh, in the office where we're just exploring the idea of this kind of uh, embedded, uh, embedded sectional object within um, a kind of more um, simple, solid, and um, and you know, you know, even the making of these pieces have also, um, you know, when you think about how do you merge two systems that have a drastically different, not just like material, like the white is three D printed, the the wood is wood, um, but also uh, you know, just how you make that make something like that is is different. Um, and how do you like work with the kind of tolerances of one and make, making sure it actually, because they're two totally different technologies. Um, and so like, for example, this wood piece is like a triple flip mill. Um, if you don't know what flip, mill, flip milling is, you mill on one side, you flip it, you mill on the other side. So you can create a kind of three-dimensional uh, piece, but then when you glue it onto two more layers that you actually don't even notice it, it's like a kind of milled thing anymore. It starts to become just three-dimensional. Um, and same thing, the idea of like, this is the same model, but the kind of front, back, and uh, side perspective of understanding that uh, this white piece might go into things and come out as a, a, a thin inlay on one side, but might become something that's much more uh, massive on the other side. So using these kind of little models that which also we work with, um, you know, we, we often introduce some of these ideas as a sem seminar in, in studio, uh, in, as a seminar, not in studio, but as a seminar uh, at SciArc and then um, working on different techniques and, and thinking about this type of assembly and then also keep developing it in our own office. So the idea of starting something in solid and then actually building a line-based uh, project from the solid is kind of reverse of how we've been doing it. And we, we've been kind of enjoying the idea of working both ways and, and seeing how to, um, to best tackle this idea of volume. So in this case, we, yeah, we, we designed it as a solid and then went into the lines. And then, as I mentioned, um, in 
in uh, the beginning, we also uh, work on uh, furniture scale things that are like, uh, we call it these kind of uh, active inlays. So like for example, this piece, uh, the, st the steel might inlay into, um, from the top you actually see as a thin inlay, but uh, from the bottom that you kind of realize it as a volume. So uh, this is also a kind of flip milled piece. The top is pretty nice too. Um, but so more um, of this idea of fitting a kind of steel for two different materials. How do you create a joinery? How do you make one that from this angle you see it as a kind of solid steel piece um, holding the end of the, the milled wood piece. But actually when you look from the bottom is actually just made of plates. So there's kind of a reading of now simultaneously surface line and volume. Or things that have, you know, lines, thin, thinness, thickness. Um, so yeah, so as I mentioned, um, we, in the beginning when we first got some of these volumetric projects, um, there were a lot of times like renovations of existing buildings. So we were asked, um, and especially in Asia, these things happen like super fast, and they're kind of, the parameters are quite crazy. Like for example, this project was, you know, it's an existing five-story building, and they said, okay, well, you have seven inches in front all the way around to do a cladding and do something great. <laughs> and you're like, seven inches? Like that's barely enough to put anything in it. And, you know, and we weren't interested in creating just like a skin project. And how do you like almost, um, how do you play with the idea of volume within a volume, this idea of this kind of embedded void and convince our client to do it? And so this is actually a, a weird trend, like a weird thing where this building eventually was going to be demolished for the, the high rise tower that we're building on the same site. So, um, and so this was the sales center for uh, those units. And what they were using was just the, the ground floor as a lobby and the fourth and fifth floor as kind of showrooms and like meeting spaces. So the second and third floor were not gonna be used. And so we thought, well, we propose an idea. What if we kind of did this Gordon Matta Clark thing where we cut a huge hole through your second and third floor and then from the bottom you can actually look up into the sky and into the, into the, show, uh, into the meeting rooms upstairs and they somehow went for it. So, um, but I think what was, um, what was from this very small move, it has such an impact on the depth and reading of the project as a, a kind of larger um, intervention, intervention into, the, into the, the volume rather than just kind of a simple skin job. So, uh, you know, in, in these kind of, for us, like transitional projects between larger work and, and, and the installation, we were really struggling, like, you know, like how do you, how does a firm our size who've done a lot of installation jump scales and do real buildings? And, you know, what happens to a line when we get to a bigger project? And, you know, we've done it in various successes. Um, so yeah, so here comes the last uh, part of our, my lecture where I actually show you how we do it. Um, and so in, in the last set of uh, three projects I will show where we really start to uh, weave this idea simultaneously, line, surface, and volume. And um, I started first with um, just the kind of work we started doing uh, in Taipei. Um, So we, we started uh, about six years ago there, and we did so many proposals. And, and you know, Taipei is, is different than China in that um, you know, they're, they're much more conservative. And um, most of the time, most of our um, proposal, they were just like, it's interesting, but no way, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, and there was a, a huge housing boom. So most of these projects were uh, housing towers. And, you know, in the beginning where we were doing these proposal and, you know, the biggest thing we were doing was, uh, you know, a, a net, you know. And so 
we were thinking about like what happens to the translation of a line when it gets to that scale. And in the beginning, we kind of just blew it up. And you know, in some ways, we were happy that these didn't get built. But it was a good exploration of how we tra like transition scale as an office because these might be just really gross lines in, in space. Um, so yeah, so we did a, a bunch of these and really struggling to think about like as, as we evolve, start to think about you know it can't just be about lines, but how do you start to uh, work with material, work with surfaces, and a, a kind of back and forth between all of those systems. So uh, fast forward to about three years ago, um, where we got our first uh, major project. This is the actual site of that building we cut a hole into, um, and also the the site that will be of our tower. And this is um, so it's in Taipei. Uh, I don't know if you, any of you know about Taipei. I mean. Um, this site is really pretty uh, amazing um, because it is on a corner and it, next to it is a uh, elementary school and across the street is a middle school and next to it is an elevated highway. So in three sides, it would not ever be ever blocked. So it was very much understood as a volume problem. This is not one that you can only design one facade, but you really have to turn the corner. Um, but you know, looking around in the kind of fabric of what is built uh, in Taipei at the time, you know, either you have the extreme on the left where there's a lot of kind of ad hoc kind of you know, everybody for themselves kind of building on the left, and then the right side, the kind of relentless cookie cutter balcony uh, housing situation that's there. And while you know, we, like some of the, we like the variation of the left, you know, we're un wondering how we can instill that with a little more system uh, to create for the right. So, uh, so this was some time where we're like, okay, well, we're gonna work with some idea about line, but what if the lines gets um, pixelated into um, a system, a system of, of layering panels? So on the top is um, a kind of, initial line work which runs up uh, the building and avoiding certain you know balconies bedrooms and and si different situations and then gets pixelated into a, s a system of panels and uh, of varying uh, different materials And this was this is the final piece just uh, finished. And so what we worked on was using this is kind of a kind of just before sundown, but um, which you actually can't see the materials. But let's look at this one. Um, we use um, layers of uh, clear glass, fritted glass, expanded metal, um, as well as even the kind of line work. There's not a panel or lines in it that is the same which is something that they've literally never done before. And they didn't realize they were like, they kind of didn't even realize they were, if they went into this, like not knowing exactly what this will look like until it was finally built. And you know, in some ways, this was a good thing because, because it was so unconventional, they were so scared to change the project so they made they let us change every like design change which will be our own so like we had full control of the project um, but yeah so then you can really see even things like you know the paneling on the handrails like it shifts from you know the salt the fritted glass to the clear glass to the mesh just to kind of um, in every scale, um, reinforce certain uh, linear movement on the facade. And so uh, this is one of the, and what I forgot to mention is that this parameter was even maybe more difficult because they said, we will give you uh, five feet of space to work with in the front and then one and a half feet to work with on the sides. So. It's like, okay, now make it really great and a lot of depth. And so this was the, the kind of one and a half feet side. And we were able to um, 
actually somehow avoid all the weird feng shui issues and not blocking window, even though most of the plan was exactly the same. Um, and more of the final piece, uh, final building. Um, another thing that was super important to us, um, this is the front where we actually get five feet of space where you know, the inset of the balconies and um, we ins really insist insisted on wrapping the corner with the paneling because it was important to make sure it doesn't feel like a single facade or skin, but it actually feels like a kind of volume, um, an overall volume that turns the corner. Yes, here just shows kind of a, a layering of material ideas. And just to say that, you know, for, for a building that really, um, we had a lot of resistance from um, just everyone from like head of sales department to, you know, they're like, how can we sell a unit where no unit is the same? And you're like, well, you, can, uh, you have to sell it differently. You know, <laughs> the idea that every uni unit is unique, that's a good thing. And I think that's one of the things that they really pitched is that, you know, just because some units where your window is a little, you know, wider and some are less, yours is never the same as someone else's and it's okay. So I think this, they're, they really started to embrace all of this kind of change in, in a really, really positive way. So yeah, so if you're ever in Taipei, please go check it out. Um, So um, we have a client, uh, 3D Systems. Uh, they're one of the biggest 3D printing companies uh, in the world. Um, they produce the technology which I just showed you. Uh, they 3D print food, which is very Jetson-y. Um, and the idea, you know, when you create a technology like 3D printing food, and you expect an industry like I mean, food industry has like been around forever and it's so established. How do you convince client, uh, client and these printers are like, you know, $100,000. So they're, they're, it's not gonna be like you and I gonna buy one of these for our, our kitchens, but it's really gonna be um, a chef and well-known chefs who figure out how to incorporate into their cooking. So, um, so when they decided to do this type of work on this, develop this technology of 3D printing food, they thought they should create um, a kind of food lab, a culinary lab that is, uh, invites um, basically chefs uh, to help them like work with them and to show them how to incorporate these kind of foods. So what you saw in, in the video before, you know, they may have certain 3D printed croutons for their French onion soup that then they pour and it kind of dissolves. So there's ways of incorporating um, this technology into the food. And like at the opening, I had like a piece of quail egg that looked like a quail egg, but they injected with a real quail, quail egg yolk in it. And then, but the quail, quail egg was made with wasabi powder. So it was like this weird, like what you think you're getting, but it's totally not what you're getting. Um, so it's it's so so they create they wanted this lab and it's obviously using a really uh, interesting technology. They came to us to do an interesting space, and um, they had uh, acquired this bank. This is uh, in LA, uh, in Hollywood, and it was an existing bank that had. If you look at the top uh, drawing, had a, a bank vault that is about. I don't know, like 18 foot concrete wall. So that vault was not going anywhere. Um, and 
another thing I was super interesting is like when you introduce a technology and you say you're going to create food with this technology, there's all sorts of regulations that like we had to go through um, health department. We had to create some sort of like uh, wholesale kitchen, but we said we're not using any uh, water because that's terrible for powder, it will get everywhere. So we have this kind of state-of-the-art uh, vacuuming system. We don't want any water, we have no grease. But like a standard health department thing for any sort of kitchen is like a grease pit and you need to have sinks and drains and all the stuff that we don't want. So there was a lot of like just even educating and like presenting to the city like how this is a new thing, this is how we cook not really cook because it's not there's no heat um, but and then so we actually made this glass box uh, in the center that is our sort of clean room for the 3d printing room and then the front of the space is um, a, a demonstration kitchen that's for when chefs come in they might do workshops and also events and then they cook alongside with printers and they're kind of making things simultaneously so, um, so we had an idea of like the, the kind of focus as they enter is this, this demonstration kitchen um, at, 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 the, at the background. And we wanted to create this kind of handrail, guardrail system that then puts that focus on, on the kitchen. So you can kind of see a sneak peek of this system. And um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, like the idea of how do you design a piece like this, you know, in, in this case, we were actually designing this piece as a kind of solid thing and figuring out how to break it down as a, a series of lines and surfaces. Um, so some of the construction, uh, construction shots of um, actually that uh, mezzanine, that cantilevers over um, the, the demonstration kitchen was, yeah, it was a complete cantilever and structurally actually not attached to any of the walls. And in this case, we actually had, um, you know, it was at a scope where we had a real contractor on the job, and um, and we um, we sub we subbed out um, just the railing portion to work um, in our uh, backyard space. So we actually made a replica so the kind of wood platform you see is a leveled uh, replica of the mezzanine space that then we created this um, undul undulating um, uh, handrail seating uh, guardrail piece and that's also very tricky is like you know there's some real serious like um, permitting issues about a, a, you know, a guardrail being certain height and then certain strengths that we had to also permit it through with our engineer who kind of vouched that this thing is like not going anywhere. And, uh, and then so we built this whole entire thing uh, actually in our, our studio space outside. Um, but they also come apart in chunks that we can put on a, a, on a truck to then uh, take it to the site. Um, this was also, just to say, this was also at a point where um, we were able to uh, experiment with um, CNC bending. Um, we had some really long, before we had bent, you go, you, most of the time you can only bend in, you know, in two direction, but it's really hard to build, uh, bend in three directions by hand. And so we, um, we sent out these tubes uh, to a CNDC bender in Wisconsin, and they came back with like 20 noodles in a, in a semi truck, um, and then came to our space. Um, so then we, uh, yeah, we were able to set it up um, and then did all the kind of infilling ourselves. And another thing to say is that, you know, I, I had mentioned the fact that when you are mixing materials and technology, so the wood part is a CNC, you know, pretty standard CNC milled uh, plates with this kind of CNC bending hand uh, cut uh, filigree steel um, handrail. You would think, I mean, even as precise as we are, um, 
when we put in all like we did, so what bef after we built all the steel pieces, we mocked up all of the, the, uh, the wood pieces on cardboard and realized there's not a single plate that is actually right. And so none of them fit. So there was a, a, a kind of, because people always think, oh, digital fabrication, it's going to save the world, and it's so easy, press a button, it's all done. But no, you, you understand that you're, you're architects, and you realize like everything has tolerance, everything has uh, ways of, you, you really have to think about this assembly process. And we knew that it wasn't going to fit perfectly, and so we tested in cardboard, and we actually had to go back in, in computer, adjust every, every uh, piece. We did that three times before we then milled the final piece so that it fits perfectly. And then this is the kind of upper uh, mezzanine area where there's a, a kind of seating um, on the side. And then um, the final completed pieces where you start to understand the kind of um, the weaving of two system of lines and surface as well as um, some of these. Um, there's some interesting also milled, like we end, we place plywood on its end and kind of mill the surface of the the counters as well as this handrail piece on the on the wall. Yeah, so there's the inset wall piece. In, in some ways, that was one of the hardest thing uh, we had to do because you realize also a lot of these things you try to do fast and um, and some of these these really require time to set and cure and. And you know, you, you, we glue a bunch of pieces together, they're gonna start warping, and then you have to really let it kind of just wait, wait it out before you do anything with it. Um, so the final, kind of standing in the back looking <coughs> forward. And then I have one more video. So the final project I'm, I'm going to talk about is uh, one of the most recent project we completed for uh, Exhibit Columbus. Um, I don't know if you guys know the city of Columbus, Indiana is a, ta a small town of 40,000 people, but it has something like 70 noteworthy architectural buildings on site. They have like three or four serenins and, you know, have done a lot and um, and what what is really a kind of amazing story about um, a private company in this case Cummins diesel engine um, they uh, set up this uh, architectural um, program where 
basically they paid for the fee of any architecture project in the county and they would um, they would fund they, they would fund it as long as you pick uh, someone from their list and their list is like you know Saarinen and Pei and you know like all these famous people so it's not like it's a bad thing mm -hmm. so then you have this town full of amazing it's like a mecca of, of you know great um, um, modernist architecture and you know in the recent times uh, the program has and you know it was funded by um, the Miller family uh, from Yale and they um, over time uh, I think you know they've gotten older and a, a lot of people in town felt like the kind of spirit of what was that made that town so magical has uh, kind of dwindled and so a couple of years ago a, a group of um, um, art curators and architects decided to um, create this exhibition called Exhibit Columbus which will be still on till you know end of November so you guys should check it out but they, um, they wanted to invite some um, emerging architects and trying to do something you know, a little different and to show the town that there's you know, other types of architecture. So, um, so it was at first a competition where there was 10 architects, five sites, and each site has two architects um, competing. So ours was um, next to, um, it was the first one, which is the Irwin uh, Union Bank, um, a Saarinen building. And um, this is a plan of the building where on the right side is the actual building with these uh, nine circles. So I'll, I'll show you later what, what that is. And the left side is, is a, a plaza. Um, and this was um, an old bank where um, in, in, in the center of, of the plan, there's a series of these can like drive-through canopies where people pull up and get money. And, and, and now it's like not being used. Um, and, you know, at that time, um, you know, Saarinen was, uh, you know, the early um, Saarinen work really had a lot of uh, Misean um, influence. And this is actually, you know, from the outside, it, it really looks like that. But then there's these kind of really interesting um, domes on the inside, which um, we th we heard that was implied um, these kind of uh, domes were um, an idea of uh, the the honey locust tree that was around and and implying the kind of domes of those trees and so you know we really wanted to you know think about you know how to take some of the ideas the Serenum was was working on and allow that as a jumping point for our, our own work and not to be completely uh, referential. But, you know, as, as you know, as later on, he's known for the, the arch and then also um, the TWA terminal. So he was really kind of playing with both this kind of merging of, of some of the early modernist ideals to some of these more organic form he was doing later. And, um, and we also found that he, he was someone who really had very interesting details. Um, so on the, the very left is that dome inside the bank. So these kind of void, uh, interesting, these voided domes in there. And then uh, these are some of his other projects where, you know, it's, it's, there's these moments where you would think an uh, end of a column would want to be something that's like holding up the, the roof, but then it sort of disappears. And, so there's a kind of not so obvious way of how assembly comes together. And then there's this kind of idea of this mysterious light that actually comes through with that. And then in some of the detail, he also works with really fine lines in his stairs and, um, and in, in his projects. So um, with all of those kind of things, um, uh, you know, the idea of the, the lines and so, the lines as volume and embedded um, voided objects. Um, I shouldn't go. There's a, so we took um, the, the existing three, now it's only a canopy of the drive throughs, and uh, we wanted to just start with a, a pretty uh, simple uh, rectangular volume and that we were also interested in just making this piece feeling more architectural rather than an art piece. And on one side becomes a solid wall that would have a kind of 
voided or filigree object embedded. And on the other side, it would be a kind of framed filigree lined walls with a um, with solid object embedded within uh, the frame. So that was kind of the final thing. And you know, a lot of things that we have not done before as a, a fabrication technique was just welding, like doing complete solid, um, you know, really uh, organic objects um, that we have never just done it before and we, we didn't know if we could do it. And, and so, um, yeah. So you can see in, in sort of these series of section cuts, understanding these kind of interesting moments or these uh, embedded objects within the two different systems. And here is a plan. So on the left is the solid with the frame, and on the right is the frame with the solid. But obviously, it's, it's not so simple, because as we transition from one to the other, you start to think about how do you terminate a line into a solid, or how do you do it vice versa. So this is the final uh, completed piece, um, which uh, itself was really like this is one of probably one of the hardest uh, installation pieces we've done, just because of the the sheer complexity of of the geometry, uh, but making it look somehow easy. Um, and the and another really tricky thing was, uh, you know, those three existing campy. Um, People loved the idea that we reused it, but it was so hard because, uh, you know, it was over time. There, nothing of that canopy was actually straight, so we had to fully three scan this entire. And actually, the ground slopes and nothing was fitting, and so we had we scanned the whole thing before we even started the project, so that we can even have an even reveal all the way around uh, the canopy pieces and figuring out how to attach it. And so while we build this piece, um, it took us about five months to build it. Um, it took us three days to put it on site, so which was you know, pretty amazing. And even like we, everything, imagine also all of these pieces actually broke down and fit it in two semi-trucks like perfectly. But none of these pieces actually are flat, so you can't just pile one on top of the other. You actually have to make crates, then suspend each of these weird-looking geometry so they don't crush the geometry, so that you can stack three high and then pack in. You know, obviously there's also budget. You can't just send out a, a, a bunch of um, semis to get this. So it, it was also like. I, I couldn't believe I was like modeling, a rhino modeling the semi truck, you know, just to make sure like, and we had like six inches of space left by the time we were like finished. Um, but I mean, that's kind of the process, right? And so, you know, over the years, you know, we really found just the way that we've worked on, you know, at this point, we really don't need to do we don't really need to do more installations to build our portfolio. We've done a lot, but we just found just through this process of making, um, it really feeds back to how we design, and we design better because we understand and know how to push these parameters. So um, yeah, so some of the, the, the final pieces. And you know, hopefully, I mean, this is our work crossing our fingers that um, eventually it, it would actually be a permanent piece that they will actually purchase. So, and the end. Um, and I, I just actually wanted to maybe just say a couple words before we close. Um, you know, over the last 10 years, we've had um, really uh, figure out how to, you know, work both like one foot in academia, one foot in practice, and figuring out how to also having uh, students that we hire over the summer work with us on these fabrications that none of them really ever even used, like barely, they, they've never done steel fabrication for sure, but it's through the kind of uh, just hard work. I mean, these are like long, like 
12 hour days every day kind of thing and you really like see a project from like beginning to the end by the end of the summer it's really one of the most kind of exhilarating things um, and that we like remember our staff based on the projects they they've worked on so anyway thank you So I'm happy to take some questions if there are any. Yes. So do you think that the line and the terms of your office's work um, matures as you jump the scale? Because I think it seems that as you start, um, like we can appreciate the line very literally, right? At like the jewelry or the furniture. Um, but it seems to sort of evolve and become less self-interested as you get like a Taipei project, right? Where it's basically hidden in plain sight. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. I mean, I think that's the goal is that, you know, we are not just a, you know, a one-liner literally, right. you know, <laughs> but uh, I, sh I should never use that joke before. So, <laughs> uh, but that we're able to, you know, really develop a system of thinking about this and be able to then evolve and become much more robust uh, about the way we work on this problem. So, yes, the hope for more maturity and keep evolving. Yes. So, how do you and your partner working together, like, do you guys, like, do you guys guess the uh, project, like, hand sketches first, like, taking up the amazing hand sketch, and then, like, go back to you at, like, modeling in the software and go back to the phone work, or, like... You, you explained it exactly. I mean, we're, we're kind of, uh, you know, we, in the beginning, we were saying we are a collaborative, mainly as a way that, you know, when Dwayne and I were at students at, at the GSC, we were really, really different. And so, you know, it would be like he would draw something, and then I would draw something, and we show each other, and then that's a way we then, based on something we learn, and we go back and draw something else. And now in the office, you know, we really um, also do that with our staff in that we kind of do something, they do something, we do something else. So it's, it's a back and forth and we're almost, we're very careful about not like doing the, the kind of helicopter hover, like, mm, I don't like that, you know? Like we usually let people like really finish a thought before moving on to the next, then before like we see it so that we you know we really believe people need to work on a problem, so. Anyone else? Yes. Is there a reason that you decided not to change the facade on the culinary lab? Because it's fairly the contrast between the outside of it where it was like a bank in the winter and then the big modern farm design. Right. Um, I think our client really liked the juxtaposition of the, the really old uh, with the new. And also it was a kind of time thing, um, just a money thing. So um, we decided not to, yeah. Yes. Where do you see yourself in five years? <laughs> well, um, I mean, I think we were definitely feeling like the start of, I mean, the things that I haven't shown, you know, w some of the more um, like project with the river and getting larger scale project that still seem to, I mean, river is really a, a long line, you know, um, and but at the same time working on some, uh, we're getting more uh, building commissions. And so, you know, I, I think we, we like to be able to continue to bounce between scales, but also work on project types that we, we haven't. So, yes. Yeah, not the building projects, but like portions of a building project, um, but mostly, yes. Yeah. I'm curious, especially, since it's especially pertinent now as the work is getting bigger and you're not going to be building everything, it seems like the, the work is generated, um, with the exception of the jeweler, it's generated through you know, computer modeling, but then built in a fairly traditional craft based way of building it by hand. And I'm just wondering if the Thinking about digital ways of fabrication are coming into the, the larger scale building. So when 
Yeah, I mean, I like to think we're also working on that in our own, you know, I was also uh, educated, you know, one foot in the digital, one in foot in the analog, and, you know, it, it, so we, we think that, you know, purely, like, we, whenever there's a budget or, you know, we're able to incorporate um, digital fabrication, we try to do it. And not every project and also the time that it takes to do it may lead to that, but I think any time we could, we try. Um, but at the same time, I find that sometimes people who are in the digital fabrication camp are really nervous about doing analog. And I think we're, because they feel like, oh, it's so old school. And I think we're just trying to say is like, these are all just tools we're gonna use simultaneously. And how do we use it the best way? And, you know, and I think we're gonna keep evolving and keep learning how to do these better and keep kind of expanding our, our, our own repertoire as the budget gets better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so with like the, the furniture specifically, like, like a lot of the furniture has like, um, like very rigid lines instead of curvy, curving ones. And so how do you like still make furniture like comfortable and ergonomical even when the lines are like have to be rigid to like maintain the aesthetical design that they have? Um. I think we're uh, exploring both. Um, I, I think, you know, with our work, we were, we're never just kind of blobby it out kind of people. And, you know, if you look at even the this project, it, there was like a set, a set of kind of rigid form that we're pushing against, and we're kind of interested in the play of, of both. And so even the furniture pieces, like, it might be a, a kind of rigid rectangle, but we might carve out certain more organic piece, like forms or, or surfaces from that. Um, I, I think we're, in, and then I think through the layering of the, the flip mill, we might start to get something that's much more organic and much more three-dimensional, so it's not just a kind of surface thing. In terms of ergonomics, um, I have to say that's, is not usually the top of our list, but we are, you know, something we learn as we, you know, try it out, and then next time we do it, like, that's, you know, we've done the furniture a few more, few times, so we keep learning from these, and like that, um, that kind of undulating chaise is actually incredibly comfortable. Um, so, you know, we're, we're learning. <laughs> All right, so one more. Right. I mean, that's always like a, a kind of where, where did you get this? Um, and a, a lot of it has to start with some of the, the drawings that, you know, we did. But as you can see, even the, the way in the beginning, the drawings were very uh, rigid and angular, and then it gets more fluid. And then there's these kind of ideas of bundling. And as we sometimes learn a technique or let's say bending or we learn we can create this type of geometry, we actually go back to the sketching and kind of work through how do we create new forms with this technique. So it's actually a, a kind of back and forth between fabrication and the things we learn and back to very basic drawings and then digital. So I, I think there's a, a play of, of all of those things that feeding into each other. So now it's not so muddy that it's like it all started as a, a, as a sketch. Awesome. Thank you, Jenny. That was okay. great. Thank you.